Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. But I wanted to specifically concentrate on raising children, especially with everything we just heard from Sheikh Zainab and the importance of really maintaining a strong identity in these times, how we can build our children with resilience. And so the first aspect of that is obviously in order to, uh, to, you know, uh, to raise your children a certain way, you have to be able to model that in yourself. So the very first um, focus here that I hope, there's three points I'm going to address, but this one is the first, which is in our tradition, there, the hadith that we use, usually reference, especially with leadership in general, is this particular hadith, ala kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyati, which is every one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his flock. And the hadith you know, goes through the different roles, right, of leaders, of men, of women. And so for women, it's very clear here. A woman is the guardian of her husband's home and his children, and she is responsible for them. So I have always loved this because it's such a powerful, again, uh, analogy to leadership, but also parenting, because think of a shepherd. And I you know, purposely picked this image here because this is a female. She is out there. She's wearing her hijab, mashallah. She has her staff, uh, and the shepherd is... If you have ever you know, learned about shepherding, it is a role that requires a lot of knowledge. You have to build your knowledge of what you're going to do, how you're gonna take care of uh, the animals that you're going to look after, and obviously be on a schedule. You have to be a regimented person. You have to be a disciplined person. You have to be a person that has all of these qualities and also has the tools necessary. And so I think the shepherd analogy is just genius on so many levels uh, because, in fact, again, um, as we see with mothering and parenting in general, there is no handbook. You know, you do have to uh, learn. And the best way to learn, of course, is to surround yourself with excellent models, you know, people that, will, that you can learn from. And so uh, in our tradition, this is why it's so important. We were just having a conversation about women sharing spaces like this and learning from each other and having, you know, Know, uh, time to actually watch and observe. I was uh, reading earlier about mirror neurons, you know, this incredible part of our brain that helps us to be empathic. It's all through mimicking and modeling that we adopt those uh, virtues and good qualities. It's because we're watching someone else. Now, how many of you, by show of hands, in your mothering journey, have you felt more isolated than surrounded by the village that we all need? How many of you have felt isolation, right? So when we look at why we struggle a lot of times, this is partly why is because we don't have that opportunity to watch our mothers and grandmothers and aunts and uncle, uh, I mean, not uncles, <laughs> aunts, and other uh, female, uh, you know, um, family members or friends who, who have children ahead of us. We're not really um, having those types of uh, gatherings and meetings. We're not socializing on that level, and that can make us feel very isolated. So shepherding back to this analogy, again, it's about leadership and really understanding what uh, that entails. So specifically to shepherding, right? What, what do we get here? Being humble. This is very important. You have to admit that this is a new domain. You don't know uh, a lot of things, and you have to be willing to take advice. You have to be willing to open. You're going to have unsolicited advice. If, you, if you've ever had children, you know what that is. You'll have people telling you about everything, how to you know, dress your child, how to feed your child, how to birth your child, all of it. But that's OK. Let it, you know, alhamdulillah, welcome that, because this is a domain that you, don't, uh, you haven't yet learned about. So humility is really important. Responsibility. Motherhood, parenting in general, it's an amana. Just like the shepherd is responsible for the flock. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you the charge of making sure they're well fed, they're safe, that they're, you're protecting them from the harm. You're, you have to see your children not as little you know, extensions of you, which is a very nefsi sort of impulse that unfortunately has come into parenting. People just want to have little trophy children. Uh, and this is totally you know, alien to our tradition. I remember many years ago, I had a debate with um, a brother, mashallah, he's a very learned brother, and he made a claim. He said, most parents are very selfish. And I was like, what do you mean by that? He said, yeah, they're selfish. Ask them why they want children. And so I started to go through all these different reasons. I said, well, you know, they want to have um, children to love. He's like, that's selfish. That's a selfish reason. I was like, 
You just want a child just to love the child? That's very selfish. Uh, I want to continue my family name? That's selfish. Uh, to take care of me in the future? That's selfish. So everything I was trying to offer, he was like, it's selfish. And then he said something, and I'll never forget it. He said, where is the parent who says, I want to produce the next Salahuddin al-Ayubi? Where's that parent? That is the intention of parenting, right? So he said, if you're not parenting with that intention, you're a selfish person. And that really opened my eyes because intentionality with everything that we do, we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim with everything that we do, even with when you want to have children. Why do you want to have children, right? So to see it that this is an amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He blesses you with a child, and to also make sure that you yourself are willing to submit because not everything is going to go your way. There are many people, myself included, I mean, how many of us who had children walked into the hospital with a birth plan, right? My older sisters left the entire time I walked into the hospital. They're like, yeah, good luck with that. Throw it out. It's right. It's, and Dr. Arifa, you know best. It, nothing will go. I wanted candles. I wanted soft music. No, no, no. I just was telling... Poor Reem in the car. I'm like, I hope I'm not traumatizing you. We told her our birth stories, Ustada Fadu and I. And I was like, 46 hour labor. Like, khalas, you think you're going to die. So you have to be willing to submit. Allah is in control, right? That's a prerequisite of being a really strong mother. Uh, and, and also making sure that you don't allow your nafs to get ahead of you, right? All of these things we're talking about is, is making sure that you are in, again, submission to Allah subhanahu wa because Allah challenges us. He says, Have you not seen the one who takes his own desire as God? And that's where living in this very materialistic culture, we can get absorbed with the, uh, you know, the commercialization of parenting. How many, uh, you know, uh, p people plan more for their nursery and for their photos that they're going to take than actually thinking about how am I going to discipline this child? How am I going to teach this child? How am I going to put them on the deen of haq? How am I going to do those things? Those are the, the things that should keep us up at night, not where's my photo shoot going to happen, right? So we have to really come back to this question. You know, don't worship your desires, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being dutiful, devoted, and watchful. Just like a shepherd, we have to be ahead. I can't tell you how many conversations. Conversations I have with parents who are unfortunately willfully ignorant. They don't want to know certain things. I was just actually speaking with Usada Fadwa as well about some parents who, even in the older phases of parenting, you know, they turn a blind eye because it's it's uh, uncomfortable for them. You know, they don't want to know about what their children are doing online. They don't want to know about the companions that they're keeping. This is very dangerous. It's uh, it's akin to a shepherd leaving the gate open for the wolves to come in. How, is you, how are you protecting your children if your, all of your gates are open? The boundaries have to be closed, and that's on you to make sure the gates are locked, right? That's on you. So being watchful, always present. Where, where are my children? Who are they with? Who are they spending time with? This is how the shepherd leads. And then being upright, resilient, and confident. Very important, as I said. Your, our children, we know this, it's researched, it's very clear. They learn best when they are model, when you are modeling the right character for them. So you have to make sure that when you want them to have a strong Muslim identity, that you are embracing your own identity. If you're going to tell them to pray, but you don't pray. If you tell them to read Quran, but you're not reading Quran. And these are, you know, I've talked to many teachers of Quran who's, who have these conversations with the parents. Their parents come to complain to them, my child doesn't want to read Quran. He's in a hefs program, he's doing this, he's doing that, she's doing this, she's doing that. And then the teacher will ask them, do you read Quran? <sighs> I don't know how to. So that's it, khalas? Because you don't know how to, you're never going to even try. I mean, think about how, uh, you know, we talk about self-harm as a physical thing. To me, that's soul harm, right? If you do not, you know, uh, understand the weight of not having access to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being harming yourself, let's, you know, make that clear right now. And I invite every sister here to never let what we call blameworthy modesty, right? It's, it's a, actually a disease of the heart because, you know, modesty is usually this concept that we understand in a positive sense, but there is blameworthy modesty, which is your, you let your haya or your shame prevent you from learning. If you don't know tajweed, you haven't learned the book of Allah, please don't let your nafs 
dictate to you. You have to say, it's, it doesn't matter if I'm 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me life every single day is an opportunity, I have to go and be that person who's going to, uh, uh, to, to prioritize and make sure that I have uh, that strong identity. So this is how we model. We, we have the upright, um, resilient, and confidence in our faith. Resilience and confidence in our faith. So this is how we shepherd. And there's much more to this, but again, in the interest of time, we're going to move on. And this hadith is really the one that I think every mother holds on to, right? Even before you become a mother. We can't wait to use this on someone, right? We can't wait. We memorize it. We don't know a lot of Quran, but every woman knows this hadith. And the one about Jannah being under our foot, right? MashaAllah. It's good. We should know all of these hadith. But we should also know that this is earned. It's not given. It's earned. If you want this status, you have to earn it. And how do we earn it? We have to understand that the Muslim mother is honored and she's honorable, right? So you, we are honored. Alhamdulillah, we're elevated. Look at the entire uh, seerah of the Prophet ﷺ from the beginning of his mission until the end of his mission. He was constantly elevating women. And that's why we're here today. Look at us. I mean, honestly, I just it's so beautiful. I wish you saw what we saw as speakers. This is breathtaking. Beautiful, modest women here learning and uh, you know their deen praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is such a great honor for us but we also have to remember that it's earned as i said so how do we earn this honor what does it mean to be honored and honorable it means being modest in word in speech in conduct and dress very important because i'm seeing and this is not to call out any specific generation but honestly, the trends that we see online are very disturbing to the soul. When you see young Muslims who are very strong, and mashallah, they have passion when they speak, but then in the same breath that they talk about their faith, they will drop an F-bomb. This is unacceptable. We do not curse. We do not use foul language as Muslim women or as Muslims. We do not dress inappropriately. We do not speak about inappropriate things, foul things. We are not vulgar people. We are honorable people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated us. So we have to elevate our speech. Right? And here in the Quran, qada aflaha al-mu'minun. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, successful indeed are the believers. Go through all of these. Look at your, and I chat, whenever I, you know, read uh, verses of the Quran, especially when describing certain groups, we should. This is how we check ourselves. You have to, you know, look in your own spiritual mirror and say, do I, you know, follow into any of these? Am I humble? Right? Do I avoid idle talk? Am I wasteful in my speech? Do I waste my time talking about nonsense that will never benefit me or anyone else and potentially harm people? Because sometimes we talk about things and we're not realizing that we could be sending someone down a very dark rabbit hole with things that we speak about. You know, you put a plant, a, a very bad seed, a weed, not a seed, right, in someone's mind. And the next thing you know, they're going down and searching and looking. And now you're going to be held accountable. Why did you bring up that topic or that, you know, that, oh, I watched this movie and, and now this person's watching the movie. Not only are they watching the movie, they've abandoned their salah. They've abandoned Quran. So we have to be very careful when we come together to make sure that our speech is valuable, right? That our way of being brings value. And this is how we are honored and what it means to be honorable. And of course, chastity and modesty. This is not just the domain of Muslim women, although it always seems to be framed that way. Every believer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, every believer, men and women alike, must be modest in dress, conduct, speech, all of that. So this is how we maintain our honor. And then the, la the third part, the Muslim mother is a refuge, strong and secure. SubhanAllah. When I think of my own uh, journey into motherhood, um, and I know there's, there may be even women here who have struggled with infertility um, and may have even gone through procedures. I actually know very, very dear beloved people to me who have um, gone through uh, procedures where the womb, their womb has been removed. And there is this spiritual connection that sometimes we don't realize, it's very real, that the word, the womb, right, it comes from the same word, rahm, right, as um, one of the, uh, or the, uh, the uh, attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, rahm. So we are connected very much to our creator through the womb, whether you're a mother or not, by the way. It doesn't matter if you've never had children or not, you have uh, this capacity, right? And so really seeing yourself as a place of refuge, if you're a mother, that your children, your family, your husband as well, we have to 
also mentioned this because we're in a time and uh, age where men and women are being constantly pitted against each other and there's so much divisive language and we're seen uh, as enemies. We're not. We're complementary to each other. And so we should provide uh, that type of security for one another. But just to have that mindset that if I am to embrace this role of mother, I also want to be a place where my children, my loved ones, always feel like they can come back. And so this is where practicing compassion. You may find with your children as they get older, they're going to have struggles. They're going to have questions. They're going to have, um, they're going to bring up maybe topics that bother you. You know, why are you, don't, don't respond. Why are you asking that? Because I, I hear from teens all the time. They get the door slammed in their face, you know, by, by their own parents on topics, you know, that they are curious about. LGBTQ, whatever it is, whatever controversial topic there is, be a place where your children come to you. You should be the first point. More than, uh, certainly before the internet, before their friends, you have to be that person that I want to be the one that my children feel safe talking to me about these things. Because if you don't teach your children how to navigate these, there are wolves in sheep's clothing who are ready to jump on them and take them and consume them. And they will. They'll, t they'll eat apart their souls. And that's exactly what they're doing. So you have to be that shepherd, that protector. That, pl that place of refuge for your children. So be that in your spirit, in your uh, ability to uh, listen before you, uh, you know, condemn or before you judge. And these are very important, um, uh, you know, concepts. Again, connecting back to um, to our natural disposition as women. We, most of us, inshallah, all of us have these qualities of nurturing and loving and protecting. But it's just really important to see yourself as this uh, in the capacity of motherhood. Now, the next slide here also is more on uh, you know, compassion and building this empathy. I mentioned near, uh, uh, mirror neurons. If you've heard me speak, you know I talk a lot about emotional intelligence. And um, you know, this concept of empathy is the fourth quality of emotional intelligence. It's something we have to inculcate. Um, and this is where you know, working on your nafs, if you have a hard time feeling empathy for people, that is a spiritual problem. Because the Prophet was empathic to all creation. I mean, he had empathy for birds and camels and animals and even Uhud when he was on Uhud and it started to tremble right with Sayyidina Umar he what did he do he gently tapped it and said be calm Uhud so if he can have empathy to the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we have to question where is the empathy within our own hearts uh, so inculcate these things and make it a priority that you work on your own nafs so that you can, inshallah, um, possess this beautiful uh, virtue of, of empathy. And these are just further hadith, just as reminders of the power of the womb. Don't underestimate the power of the womb. It will, in fact, be given the capacity to speak like all of our limbs. So when you practice, when you don't practice empathy, and I've seen this unfortunately in our community where relations are cut, people get, you know, done, I'm, I'm done with her, I don't want to talk to her. This is not our way. This is not our language. This is not our language to have rifts in family families. We should know, this is a kaba'ir. From the 17 kaba'ir, which are the enormities, it's among the top to cut people off. So if you know family members, aunts, uh, or, or you know, grandparents, or whoever, where there are these uh, things exist, work on softening the hearts, especially as the month of Ramadan draws near, we should really be intentional about trying to remove this uh, break in family. Uh, uh, Sheikh Zainab mentioned this, that this is what this culture aims to do, to divide, destroy families, to break families apart. They would love nothing more than all of us to be cut off from one another. One another. But our Lord calls us to not do that and to actually resist our own nafs and to work on practicing empathy, being uh, understanding that people are struggling. We have so many challenges. SubhanAllah. And so, uh, again, I'm sorry, I don't know how much time I have left, but just in the last uh, two slides, because I'm sure you can see the theme here. MashaAllah, Sheikha did much better with bringing her uh, kathia, but our hearts, our hearts, where are they? We're here, but our hearts are somewhere else. And so I wanted to just take a moment, because these are the extraordinary mothers that we learn from. Look at their example. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't change the slide. I apologize. I mean, I'm sure we saw all of these in the pictures and videos that were coming out. These are the ones that, oh, when I would look at them, my heart. I mean, look at this woman, mashallah, bathing her children in the middle of rubble, smiling. That is what a mother does. She shields her children from the harm around her. So learn, 
feeding, protecting, covering, dragging, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, constantly turning to Allah. This is the mother that we aim to be. Not the mother who again is all over social media in her polished, filtered world. That is not the mother you want to be. And I'm not judging people, I'm just saying don't aspire for that. Aspire for the faith of women like this. This is what motherhood is in our deen. And this woman, mashallah, she just took my breath away when I saw this picture. One of my favorite hadith is Al-Mu'min Al-Mir'atul Mu'min. And it's a challenge because, you know, what it means is that we supposed to, we're supposed to reflect, right, beauty to one another. We're supposed to reflect, and I think most of us, the reason why we're moved by these images is because we see in these women what we hope we have, right, the qualities that we wished we possessed. So when we see their strength, I mean, she looks like everything that we just talked about, strong, honorable, devout. Look at her hands. I mean, those are the hands of a working woman, right? Humble, courageous, resilient, modest, watchful. So this is the definition of motherhood in our deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us, inshallah, the best of mothers, and may he give us strength and help us to raise children who love him and love his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.